City, we love to read God's word and we're trying our best to treasure it, to understand it, to follow it, and faithfully obey it. We're going to look at our first heading today, God's past grace. Now the text I just read from is an ancient text. It's an ancient text written by Paul to a group of Christians in the city of Thessalonica. Christians throughout the centuries have believed that this book right here and the text we just read from have been penned by authors. They've been written by human authors. But as those human authors were writing these letters and histories and poems, God's hand, God himself, was carrying them along. So again, Christians throughout the centuries have believed that this book is written by both humanity and God himself. Again, Paul is specifically writing Christians in a Roman-ruled city, the city of Thessalonica. Now, we read this whole letter and even the text we just read, and we see the deep affection that exists between Paul and the recipients of this letter. And there's this deep affection because there's relationship here. Why is there relationship here? Well, sometime before, Paul, as almost like this church planter or pastor, He came to the city of Thessalonica. He came in love. He was motivated by love. And he preached the message of Jesus and God's grace. Now, some of the people, not everybody in the city, some of the people in that city responded to that message and they kind of, they, 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 they kind of bind it together as a community of believers. It's, It's what a church is. A church is simply kind of everyday people that are binding together because of their common belief in Jesus Christ. What ultimately united them was God's grace. So what do I mean when I say God's grace? God's past grace, his present grace, his future grace. Grace can kind of be a churchy word. And I just want to make sure everybody here, we have clarity and understanding when I say or I speak about this biblical idea or concept of grace. Because if there's one thing I want you to get, it's this idea of grace. This is kind of one of the pillars. This is at the center of the Christian faith. Even if you're here and you'll never believe in Jesus, I at least want you to understand what we as Christians believe. Now, the word grace, the Greek word for grace is kados. It appears over 120 times in the New Testament. It's a word that's really easy to define. It's kind of harder to apply and live under. The definition for grace is simply unmerited or unearned favor. Unmerited or unearned favor. And when we're talking about biblical grace, it's the unmerited or unearned favor of God to humanity in the person of Jesus. I just want to slow down there. We're talking about biblical grace, unmerited or unearned favor from God to us. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it in the person of Jesus. Now, I think grace is actually really, really hard to, like I said, kind of accept, believe, and live out of because so much of our society is merit-based, right? We are judged by the performance and the value that we bring into this world. And even as a first grader, me, Gabe Garcia, I understood that I moved up the ladder of my first grade classroom if I perform. This performance mentality was built into me even at a a very young age. I remember it was a month before uh, summertime, a month before we would go into the second grade, and I was feeling pretty good about myself because I had outperformed all my classmates the entire year. And I knew I outperformed them because my name was never written on the board. Do you guys remember that? Like, and I was the guy, like, I was the good kid, well-behaved, ready to raise my hand, never getting in trouble. But a month 
before the second grade, my name got put on the board. The, the, the atrocity of this moment. <laughs> Right, and, and, and not just my name, the dreaded check mark went next to my name. And I remember as all of my classmates went out to lunchtime, I stayed back. My teacher didn't even know I stayed back. And I just, I wept because my whole identity of being a performer came crashing down. I just want us to understand that the good news of the gospel is not about our performance. The good news of the gospel is about ultimately God's performance and his love and his grace and his mercy to us in Jesus. New City, Jesus is the gift. All we have to do is receive this gift. The Christian faith isn't 19 things to make it to God. It's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And the question is, will you receive it? And when we receive this gift by faith, we open this gift and there's more inside this gift. There's forgiveness. There's reconciliation to the Father. There's peace that goes beyond understanding. There's the hope of an eternal life. It's a gift. And all God is asking us is to receive this gift. Now, again, you may be here and you're not so sure what this Christian faith is all about. But if the Christian faith is all about grace, don't you want that to be true? That there would be this God that actually wants a relationship with, with us and he sees us in all of our mess and still he says, I want to know you. Like what intellectual objections do you have to a God who is infinitely gracious? I want us to see that is, this is... Uh, a theme that is carried throughout all the New Testament. I said it was uh, referenced 120 times. We're not going to look at all 120 verses, but we're going to look at three really quick. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So if you came here today and you're thinking Christianity is just a, a bunch of lists and rules and um, an attempt to kind of perform and work our way up, this merit-based thing, that's not the gospel. For by grace you've been saved. Through faith, this is not your own doing. This is the gift of God, so we can't boast. If it's about us, we can boast. Hey, God, look at all the things I'm doing. But it's not about us. We as Christ followers say, hey, you know what? We want to boast about God because it's all about him. Romans 3.23 says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified. It's a legal term, freely by his grace. How are we justified? In the courtroom of God? How are we declared forgiven? How are we seen as righteous? It comes by grace through the redemption that comes by Christ Jesus. In Titus 2.11, for the grace of God has appeared, right? It's not just this ethereal idea. Grace actually showed up in the person of Jesus. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. So this is the message that Paul showed up with when he came to the, reg uh, the region of Thessalonica. And this is the message that they responded to. How do we know they responded to this message? We see it in 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Paul will say this, we thank God continually because when you receive the word, that's the word of the gospel, the word of God's grace, we received the word of God, which you heard from us. You accepted it, not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. So when I talk about God's past grace, what I'm talking about is the unmerited, unearned favor, this gift that God accomplished through the person of Jesus. And if you're here today and you follow Jesus, I'm talking about God's work in us to ultimately help us see our need for Jesus and the beauty of Jesus. That's what we're calling God's past grace, what he accomplished in Jesus and what he accomplished in some of our lives. Now, if you're here today and you've never responded to the message of Jesus, I just, quick little plug, if you will, um, I want you to know, no matter who you are and what you've done, there's nothing you've done that would keep God from showing you grace today. If you responded, 
God would meet you with his never-ending grace. God's past grace. Let's talk about God's present grace. God's present grace. I think one of the the most foolish things that Christians can do is depend on God to kickstart their their faith journey, but then depend on themselves to continue their faith journey. One more time. One of the most foolish things we do as Christians is say, God, I need your help. Show me your grace to kind of begin our faith journey. But then we begin to depend on ourselves to continue our faith journey. I remember when my dad, uh, very vividly, tumbleweed way, when he taught me to ride my bike. And like many dads or uncles or big brothers, he grabbed one handlebar, he put his hand on the back of my seat, and he ran with me as I pedaled. And and surely, uh, uh, after a couple feet of running, uh, my father stopped, and I began pedaling all by myself. For many of us, this is how we see or imagine the Christian journey. God is there to help me and guide me, but the rest is up to me, and I'm just gonna pedal all by myself. God, I actually don't need you. I've got this. I can keep this going all by myself. I want you to know that the grace we need to begin our faith journey is the same grace we need to continue our faith journey. We need it day one, and we need it day two, day three, until Jesus comes back and makes all things new. There is never a day, New City, when we don't need God's grace. Every moment of our lives, we need God's unearned, unmerited favor. If we want to make progress in the Christian faith, we need his grace. Again, it's our responsibility to make sure we put ourselves in a position to receive it. How do we receive that grace? It starts simply by just asking. After graduating high school, uh, I went to a junior college for two years. Now, all through high school, um, I was a B student. I wasn't a B minus student, I wasn't a B plus student, I was a B student. Now, being a B student is not necessarily going to get you into any great university. So when I went to to junior college, I knew I needed to not be a B student. I needed to be an A student. And one of the things I found on my junior college campus, they had something called the Writing Center. And inside the Writing Center, there were these expert writers that were ready to turn any C paper into a B paper and any B paper into an A paper. And once I realized that the writing center was free, and once I realized these expert writers were just sitting there waiting for you to walk in and help you out, every single day I put myself in a position to turn a B paper into an A paper. I waited in line, I knocked on the doors, I emailed to make sure they were going to be open. I took advantage of all the help that was being offered to me. If you decide to follow Jesus... There's some people here that are going to decide to follow Jesus in the next week, month, year, or two years. I want you to know we don't just receive God's grace on day one. We need God's grace every single day. And we just have to put ourselves in a position to receive it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. Let me read this passage. But Timothy has just come to us from you and has brought us good news about your faith and love. And he has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all of our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. Last week, I don't know if you guys remember, Uh, But Dr. Reverend Brian Leander, he did an awesome job showing us how Paul, kind of as this spiritual big brother and father, wanted to go back and check on the Thessalonians, but he was prohibited from visiting this community. But what we come to find out is though Paul wasn't able to visit the Thessalonians, he sends Timothy. 
Now, Timothy comes back to Paul, and what's happening here is that Timothy comes back with this amazing report. Verse 6, there's good news about their faith and love. Verse 7, Paul says, we're encouraged by your faith. This church is excelling. They're thriving. They're doing amazing. But I want to contend that the progress that the Thessalonians were making was because they were dependent on the grace of God. God's grace was actively involved in carrying them through their Christian journey. And I don't know if you remember, you can go back and read in Acts chapter 17, but this is a hostile region. It's not a region that's open to Christians. It's not a region that's excited about the gospel, and yet they're thriving. Why are they thriving? Because of God's present grace. Yes, they worked, but they worked in dependence on the grace of God. So here's my question for everybody in this room. Is there anything you're trying to accomplish today in your own strength? Is there anything you're trying to accomplish today in your own strength? And can we just admit that sometimes that's exhausting? What if there was a God who was willing? What if there was a God who was able? What if there was a God who was actively engaged in helping us become the people that he designed us to be? Wouldn't that be good news? That God doesn't just kind of get us started and then run the other direction and kind of fold his arms and say, now impress me? That's not good news. That's not the gospel. But God begins and then is actively involved to help us become the people we want to be so that as we're striving to be the mom we wanted to be, the father we wanted to be, the employer that we wanted to be, the employee that we wanted to be, as we're striving to be the neighbor we want to be, as we're striving to be more loving, more patient, more kind, more generous, what if we weren't depending on our own strength? But what if there was a God who is willing and able to help us in our time of need. That's good news. Listen to what the author of Hebrews says. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. It's a throne of grace. What an image. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. If you're experiencing a time of need right now, you're not alone. And we will forever experience a time of need. But this is what God says, that those who have chosen to follow Jesus, we can, ex- we can move towards God's throne with confidence. That gives me chills. Almighty God, creator of the world, sitting on a throne, and I get to walk with my head held high. Why is that? Because of his past grace. Because of his past grace, I now have a new identity, a new position, a new status, and I get to walk with confidence. And when I walk toward this throne of grace, what will I receive? I'm going to receive more grace. I'm going to receive his present grace to help me in my time of need. Again, one of the most foolish things that Christians do is depend on God's grace to kickstart their Christian journey and then depend on themselves to continue their Christian journey. As we think about the type of community that God is building here, we want to be the type of community that's always crying out for God's present grace to help us in our present time of need. Amen? Amen. Lolly, we're going to skip the next couple of slides, and I'm just going to go to my... Last point here, we looked at God's past, we looked at God's present, and now we're going to look at God's future grace. Wherever we're at today, wherever you're at today, is probably not where we need to be tomorrow. For the Christian, life is a journey to become more like Jesus. He is the goal, he is the destination, he is he's the target. But this life towards Jesus is a long journey in the same direction, as one pastor and theologian would often say. For the Christian, it's one long journey 
in the same direction as we move towards Jesus. None of us wake up and say, you know what? I figured it out. I arrived. I'm done. If you want to know what Jesus looks like, just look at me. (laughs) That's not how it goes. And Paul knows this about the Thessalonians. So Paul is thrilled by where this church is at, but he's not under the assumption that they still don't have progress to make. He's thrilled by where they're at. He's thanking God. He's rejoicing. Their faith, hope, and love, it's amazing. But he also understands they've still got progress to make. 1 Thessalonians 3.10 says this, Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Why does he want to supply what is lacking in their faith? Because their faith isn't complete. There is still progress to make. Verse 12, May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else just as ours does for you. Paul's praying that their love would increase. Why? Because their love isn't complete. There's still progress to be made. So in one verse, he's commending them for their faith and love. You're doing great. And in another verse, he's anticipating God's future grace. He's anticipating that God is going to continue to work throughout the future to to increase their faith and love. That's the kind of God Paul believed in. Not a God whose grace easily runs out like the mint chocolate chip in my freezer. (laughs) A God whose grace is never ending. He will continue to extend it over and over again. Now, if I was writing a letter to this church, New City Church, my letter, I feel like, would have some of the same tone and features of Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. I see your faith. I see your love. I see your tangible acts of service. I see your generosity. I see your your sacrifice. I see it, and it encourages me, and I give thanks to God. And at the same time, I know none of us, including me, have arrived And since none of us have arrived, we should be able to identify the areas that we still want to make progress in. Can you identify an area or two or three? Not an area of my life that I need to make progress in. Think about yourself. Is there an area or two or three that you want to make progress in? Oftentimes Christians are um, criticized for being filled with hypocrisy when we fail to live according to our, our, our confession of faith. So maybe you're here today and you've often thought Christians were, were hypocrites. Maybe you're here today and you've seen other people judge you for maybe some hypocrisy in your life. Um, but hypocrisy isn't really the absence of sin. Hypocrisy is the absence of confession and repentance. Okay? Okay? It's not the absence of sin. None of us are expected to be perfect, right? None of us have arrived. We're always making progress. So hypocrisy isn't the absence of sin. It's the absence of confession and repentance. My prayer is that we would be a repenting and confessing community every single day, every single week, kind of able to identify and confess the areas where our life fails to match up to the love of Jesus. And I believe that if we are repenting and a confessing community, I'm confident that God's future grace will show up. God's future grace will show up in your life, my life, and the life of this church. And each and every one of us will continue to make progress towards the goal, the destination, the target is Jesus. If we're repenting and a confessing community, unashamed to identify the areas that fail to match the perfection of God in all his glory. I believe God's future grace will meet us right where we're at so that we can make progress. And I just want you to imagine that. Think about how exciting that is. That a year from today, we would be able to look back and see all the ways God's grace 
met us as a community so that we would make progress in our faith, our hope, and our love. God's grace is never-ending. So whether you're a doubter, skeptic, seeker, or follower, when you think of God, what do you think of? For many of us, we view God as somebody who is far and distant, someone who is frustrated and even exasperated with us, someone whose love and grace is easily running out. But when we move towards Jesus in faith, God will forever look at us and view us through the eyes of a perfect father. None of us have had perfect fathers in this room, but there is a perfect father who is not tired with us, is not frustrated with us, is not impatient with us. He, he's not absent or distant. He's a father that is active and engaged and always working for our good. New City, God has everything we need. He has everything we need, and he's willing to help anyone who will humble themselves and simply cry out for help. We've got to just put ourselves in a position to receive that grace. And my prayer today, um, Silly is going to come up and play on the keys for a minute or two. My prayer is today, wherever you're at in your spiritual journey, Today might be a day where you just simply, in the quiet of your heart, cry out to God for help. I'm going to give us a a minute, and then I'm going to come back up, and I'm just going to close us in prayer. Nobody's going to be looking at you. Nobody's going to ask you questions. This is just a moment for you to kind of connect maybe with God. And Maybe there's some people here that have been following Jesus for 10 years, and they're thinking about something in their life that is making life exhausting. Maybe it's that person you've wanted to forgive but haven't forgiven. Maybe it's the struggle to turn away from things that are tempting and distracting. I just want to give you a moment. And in this moment, would you just cry out for God's grace to help you in your present need? And maybe there's somebody here today that hasn't began their Christian journey. They don't have all the answers. They still have questions. You still have maybe a few doubts but maybe you're convinced of who Jesus is and you want to taste and experience the God of never-ending grace. Maybe you would just have a moment to simply cry out to God and say, God, I want your grace and I want to follow Jesus. I'm going to give all of us this time and this moment and I'll come close us in prayer in a minute or two. Everybody's eyes closed, heads bowed. If you're here today and you cried out that prayer to start and begin your Christian journey, we just want to pray for you. We don't want to put you on the spot. Um, We're not going to call you up front. We just want to, as as a team and a staff, be praying for you. If you prayed that prayer, would you simply just raise your hand so that we can be praying for you throughout this week and hopefully come alongside you and help you make progress in your Christian faith. If you're here today,
Heavenly Father, we thank you. We just thank you for the time to think about deep things. There's times to party, there's times to watch the Super Bowl, and there's times to think about what life is all about. And I hope today we walk away from, from our time together refreshed and reminded that God is a good Father who delights to come alongside us and shower us with His grace every single day. We know your grace is at the center of the biblical story. We know your grace is at the center of the Christian faith. I pray that your grace would be at the center of this church. So Heavenly Father, especially for those people that maybe raised their hands for the first time today, we rejoice and we ask that in your grace you would continue to keep them close to you. And we thank you for who Jesus is and all that Jesus has accomplished on our behalf. It's in his name we pray. Everybody said, amen. amen.